Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. All right, good evening and come to order, please. This is the May 18th, 2020, 7 p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey. We have with us tonight in person, present, um, Steve Carter, Vice Chair, and Commissioner Bill Lashley. Also uh, joining us by telephone, we also have Commissioner Tim Sutton. And Tim, Ms. Mr. Sutton, are you there? Present. And we also have Commissioner Eddie Boswell. Commissioner Boswell, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for um, volunteering to be our call-in commissioners tonight so that we uh, can facilitate having a, a meeting with the quorum that's present. Um, we also have, we're limited to having 10 people gather. So besides the three commissioners who are present, we also have our IT director, um, Bruce Walker and our clerk tori frank our county attorney Clyde albright our county manager brian haygood sheriff terry johnson and our finance director susan evans so thank you all for being here so uh with that commissioner lastly would you please lead us in the invocation hey, glad pledge? Please. let us pray gracious heavenly father we pause at this time to honor you we thank you for loving us we thank you for loving our nation. We just ask you to, to continue to bless our nation's leaders, bless our county, and uh, as we set out to do the people's business, we ask you to, to give each one of us a special blessing to do the right thing. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on our agenda is public speakers who want to address the board uh, for an agenda-related item. Um, callers are limited to three minutes, or speakers are limited to three minutes. We have the option where people can email comments or they can ask for us to call them. I understand that we have someone who wanted to be called tonight. Yes, Madam Chair, that is correct. <laughs> to call them. And what is the person's name? Beverly Ross of Gibsonville. Beg your pardon? Beverly, Beverly Ross, Ross of Gibsonville. Gibsonville. Hello? Miss Ross? Yes. Okay, you are part of the county commissioners meeting. Hi, Miss Ross. I'm, I'm Amy Gailey. I'm chair of the county commission. Um, thank you for being a public speaker tonight and asking us to call you. Just wanted to mention before you get started with your comment that you have three minutes, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. Please call in when you're ready. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, again, my name is Beverly Ross, and I live on the Alamance County side of Gibsonville. And I'm speaking on behalf of my family, including my sister, uh, who is the Gibsonville Alderwoman Yvonne Maysland. And she would also be making a comment tonight. Uh, but Gibsonville is also having their Board of Alderman meeting uh, as well. My comments relate to the allocation of the funds from the CARES Act. I understand our our county, according to the newspaper, uh, will be receiving uh, an allocation, maybe you already have an allocation of uh, 3 million out of 150 million for the state. And I'm hoping um, you'll provide more information during the meeting tonight, specifically of what each town can expect. I guess I would strongly encourage uh, you to reimburse the actual expenditures that are specifically required to address the coronavirus such as the PPE, uh, disinfectants, testing, 
uh, I guess any and all health department requirements that were mandated and continue to be continue to be mandated over and above what was previously required. Um, I am encouraging uh, to use using actual receipt versus something that might be relatively arbitrary, such as just population estimates uh, that was referenced in the newspaper, especially in light of the, the recent growth in some of the communities. Um, thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Ms. Ross, very much. Um, okay. I'll be watching. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, do, we have any other, do we have any other public speakers? Not at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you. So, do we have any commissioner responses to Ms. Roth? We want to wait yeah. until the agenda item comes up. Okay, uh, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Boswell, do you want to wait until the agenda item comes up? Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve the agenda from Mr. Lashley and a second from Mr. Carter. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the next is uh, item is a approval of the consent agenda, which is just the minutes from a couple meetings. I move to approve. approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Lashley and a second from Mr. Carter. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, next item is a public hearing. So this is a public hearing for a proposed installment financing agreement to finance a portion of the cost of various projects um so that we uh, discussed this at the last meeting and got information about that before i ask for a motion to open the public hearing do any of the commissioners have a question about the, what we're uh, talking about the installment contract financing agreement if not if we could have a motion to open the meeting or open the public hearing motion to open second Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley to open the public hearing. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, we don't really, we don't have anybody present to ask. Usually I ask anybody on this room, side of the room have anything to say, anybody on that side of the room have anything to say. But I do understand from our clerk that we have a couple of emails about this chair. topic. So if you would proceed with reading those, please. Okay. The first public hearing comment is from George Adams, 317 Bidney Drive, Burlington. Based on the article in the Burlington Times News this morning, if you need 2.2 for more unfinished projects, then why not use the $3 million CARES Act money? article says it is your the commissioner's decision local governments would just waste it on tool design schemes and more pools for areas that have torn up the pool they already had might want to save this money for abss for the lawsuits over forcing kids back into covid 19 hot houses when governor cooper has been saying for months that we should stay at home in order not to get the virus. The next set of public comments comes from Henry Vines, 3450 Isley Drive. Good evening, commissioners. He hopes you all are doing well and safe. He would like to encourage you not to borrow any more money at this time. The county does not need more debt to have to increase next year's budget. With a shortfall of income on this year's budget and uncertain of next year's projections, it makes no sense to him to borrow money just to put it in the fund balance. The county has paid for the project already and we're still good on fund balance at about $18 million. The money is not needed now. Why not wait and borrow it if and when it is needed Paying out interest is not a good way to get ahead. 
I do not see this as a very conservative way of doing business for taxpayers. The way the county is headed in, but us, the taxpayer, deeper in debt is leading only one way, higher property taxes in the near future. To pay back close to $1 million in interest for $2.3 million over 15 years, as a businessman makes no sense when I have the money in the bank to pay for upgrade or even repair. This is not the time to increase the budget. It seems we need to look at ways to cut it. Thank you for letting me express my feelings and hope it will change your mind on borrowing this money. Henry Vines. Alright, thank you. Is that um that is all the comments that's that all I've the received. Comments? Okay, um, if we could have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay, Mr. Lashley has made a motion to close the public, public hearing, and Mr. Carter has seconded it. All in favor, please say aye. Um, aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, typically, I mean, before we go on with the other presentations, uh, typically what would happen when we have a public hearing is we will go ahead and vote on or discuss and vote the uh, subject to the public hearing. But um, I have some information to share with uh, the public. So Senate Bill 704 was recently signed into law. Under the new law, a public body may conduct any public hearing required or authorized by law during a remote meeting and take action thereon, provided the public body allows for written comments on the subject of the public hearing to be submitted between publication of any required notice and 24 hours after the public hearing. Although not everyone agrees on this, law school professors at the UNC School of Government believe that this means action can't be taken immediately after the hearing. So the board would need to recess the meeting or schedule a new meeting after the 24-hour period at which time they can take a final vote. So my understanding is that we'll have this up for a final vote at our next regularly scheduled board meeting in June. Is that yes. right? That would comply with the law. Great. And the public still has 24 hours to submit um, public comments. That's correct. So they're not, I guess we made a motion to close the public hearing, but since this is a remote meeting, they still have 24 hours That's to submit correct. comments. Great. All right, is there anything else I need to say or do about the public hearing? I think that's it. I think you've covered it. Thank you. Great. So next on our agenda is an update on uh, the COVID-19 virus from our health department. So we're going to go get our director of the health department, Stacy Saunders. Saunders, Thank and I you. think you're the tenth person in the room. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I don't need to say everybody's name. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I've come tonight just to give you a COVID-19 um, update um, about our local response and what the landscape looks here um, in North Carolina. So I'll start with just the. Um, global and then U.S. perspective and then move into um, North Carolina and Alamance mm -hmm. County. So as of this morning, um, there were about 4.7 million cases globally with 315,000, uh, about 316,000 deaths. Um, in the U.S., as of this morning, one point, about 1 1.5 million cases um, with um, 89,000 deaths recorded at this time. Here in North Carolina, as of this uh, morning, 19,023 cases with um, 661 deaths um, and 511 hospitalized. And then here in Alamance County, as of this morning, um, we identified our first case of um, COVID-19 on March 20th and since then have identified 224 cases. Of those, 119 have been released uh, from isolation. Um, 
of those total 224, 94 of them remain active and are in isolation. And included in that 94 active cases um, that remain in isolation, 21 of them are receiving care at a hospital. And sadly, we've experienced uh, 11 deaths related to COVID-19 so far in our community. As of this morning, it was um, 99 counties with at least one confirmed case, but I think on my way here, I heard that Avery um, identified their first case, so I think we're now at 100, uh, 100 counties with a confirmed case. Um, typically, I let you know about what's happening in the region, too. So in Wake, um, we have lots of cases, lots of counties around us who have significant number of cases as well. Wake having um, 1,239 with 28 deaths, Durham um, 1,009 with 38 deaths, Orange um, 277 with 36 deaths, Guilford um, with 861 with 47 deaths. Chatham um, at 512 uh, with 24 deaths and Caswell at 44 cases with one death. Um, so since May 14th, which is um, the last five days, we've had 34 new cases. <coughs> 10 have been associated with our uh, long-term care facility outbreaks and 24 have been in the general population, which is a ratio of about 29 to 71. So 29% um, in long-term care facilities and 71 in general population. Of the 11 deaths that I mentioned um, associated with COVID in our community, three have been in general population and eight have been associated with a long-term care facility outbreak. We've identified two long-term care facility, oh, uh, we have identified two uh, long-term care facility outbreaks in our community. Uh, one being at Peak Resources, who has two confirmed cases amongst their staff um, and no other cases reported at this time. The health, the health department um, did deploy and collect staff and residents um, for Peak Resources, and thus far those uh, results have been negative. We still have some uh, tests pending. White Oak Manor um, is the second long-term care facility um, outbreak that we're experiencing. To date, they have 58 cumulative cases uh, within their facility, with 47 being in residence and 11 being in staff, and um, eight deaths thus far. Um, Alamance County Health <coughs> Department has collected staff and residents for White Oak Manor as well. Um, a second round of collection um, did happen today for staff who were initially negative and started showing symptoms. So we did a small group today. Uh, what we have done is merged, um, you've heard me talk about the long-term care facility task force that we created at the health mm -hmm. department. We merged that with a long-term care facility collaborative um, that includes um, our hospital of Cone Health ARMC and Cone Health um, out of Guilford, UNC Health System, um, EMS, the health department, and some other stakeholders, um, and all the long-term care facilities um, themselves in that collaborative with or without an outbreak. And um, we use that collaborative as a way to report out um, things that are going on in the long-term care facilities, any new guidance, um, any partnerships, any support that, that um, can happen for the facilities at that time. I will say that today, Department of Health and Human Services did release um, that they'll be providing PPE, that's personal protective equipment, to long-term care facilities. Um, working through the North Carolina Emergency Management Department um, and the National Guard to get that those supplies out to long-term care facilities across the state. Where do they ship those supplies? I'm sorry? To, where, do they, where do the supplies come to? Do so you get them? I, it did not state in the press release. I do not think the health department's going to get it. I uh -huh. think that either they're going to go from North Carolina emergency management to your local emergency management, yeah. or they're going to use National Guard to actually deploy them. Because they did mention, um, I think in one of the pre uh, press brief briefings, that they had deployed National Guard to um, a certain number of counties. So it could happen in a couple of different ways. I'll try to find out more for you. And so just to uh, go through the breakdown um, and give you more of a picture of what, what does COVID-19 look like in our community, every, um, every week we update the cumulative case breakdown uh, by race and ethnicity, also by age, and then by zip code, which you'll see soon. 
So this looks slightly different than the one you saw a couple weeks ago, and it's meant to because it's um, changing as the case count increases and we get um, additional cases. And so here, um, race is listed uh, first. So your first one, two, three, four, five, six columns are race. Your last two columns are gonna be ethnicity. And so um, we have the green being your general population of Alamance County distribution of population. Um, the blue is the distribution of that um, population um, by the cases. And then the yellow is a comparison um, bar for you of North Carolina confirmed cases. And so in our general population distribution, you'll see um, that for our black and African American um, demographic, that in our general population, it's around 21%, um, but amongst our cases, it's about 29%. Um, so just slightly higher than what we would expect in, in the distribution. And additionally, as you move across and look at ethnicity, we see um, the general population, what, what um, our general population in Alamance County looks like is about 12.8%, almost 13% um, identify as Hispanic. Yet among our confirmed cases, we have um, over 31% of the cases are identifying as Hispanic. And you can see that in the state um, as well, um, that you've got, uh, we're, we're mimicking the state pretty closely with that one. And so just some context contributions as to that, that um, historically marginalized um, populations also tend to have risk factors. So the same social drivers that drive chronic disease or poor health outcomes are the same social drivers that are going to be impacting infectious disease outcomes. And so things that um, like low income or low access to care, um, those with housing or food insecurity, um, these type of social factors also affect infectious disease as well. And so that could be at play here. Um, folks might be more likely to have high contact employment, meaning lots of face-to-face -face types of employment um, in things like retail, service industry, food, those types of things that increases their likelihood of exposure. Um, amongst the ethnicity groups, um, they, we did have a regional, like we did have a meatpacking um, plant fact, a factory um, outbreak in a neighboring county that had a high um, employee population that was Latinx and um, many of their employees while working in uh, that county lived in other counties and so we did um, have several cases associated with that as well uh, that may be at play here. And here's your cumulative case um, breakdown by age. Um, so one that I want to point out is that we, so we're the blue uh, compared to North Carolina confirmed cases in the um, yellow. One of the places that we stand out here um, is the um, greater than 65 year old uh, range. This is not surprising given that we've had long-term care facility outbreaks. And so um, typically the residents in long-term care facilities are gonna be um, usually older. And so we're, this is likely contributing to this, um, strat this breakdown um, as we stratify by age. And then here are your cumulative cases by zip code. Um, I reported last time that um, DHHS has um, placed an interactive uh, map on their dashboard uh, for zip code and you can zoom in to um, your desired zip code. Um, and then we've just broken that out for you in a pie chart on the other side um, to give you an idea of what that looks like here. Um, so about 50% of our confirmed cases are in the 27217 zip code. Um, one long-term care facility is in that um, zip code, so that's likely contributing to that. Though I will say that that zip code um, has consistently held the largest burden of cases. Um, and I just wanted to remind folks that while um, we do have long-term care facility outbreaks happening. Uh, the majority of our new cases have been in the general population in the last um, week or so. About 15% of um, our case burden has been in 27215, um, which is also a Burlington um, zip code uh, that also includes Elon and Gibsonville. 
with 14 percent being in 27253 which is um, part of burlington graham sax paul switzenville a little bit of hall river i think and then 10 percent in 27302 uh, which is mebane and hall river and then some um, other zip codes with much smaller case burdens And this last graph is the uh, new cases epi curve. So these are the new cases by day. Um, we talked last time that um, as you look at cumulative case um, curves, they're always gonna increase because we're adding. Um, so the new cases by day gives you an indication of um, what of the epi curve that we're looking for. Are we going up and then coming back down the other side? And you can see here that overall we look pretty low and slow, which is exactly what we want. Um, we haven't seen a fast and high uh, peak. We actually started off pretty um, slow and steady. And instead of um, large peaks, what we kind of what we're seeing here is what I would describe as more like steps. So we we see a bit of a rise and we plateau for a little bit, and we see a bit of a rise and we plateau again. Um, to be determined how that's going to flush out for the for the rest of it. But if you uh, the, blue, um, the blue lines are the actual absolute number of cases, um, and then the green line is the seven-day average to help smooth that out a little bit for us to see what that curve is really looking like. So you can see the overall impression right now is that we are increasing still. And then I just wanted to add at the end, um, you hear me, you get to see me, and you get to hear me talk about all the things we're doing, but I wanted to show you a little bit of the things that have been happening as well. And so I wanted to uh, share with you a couple of scenes of our most recent collection event to collect um, over 140 um, individuals who were staff members of one of the long-term care facilities. and. Um, just to show you a little bit of what a partnership really looks like when we do um, when we do communicable disease and out, outbreak mitigation within a community, and so um, here we had the health department staff, uh, we had emergency management, Burlington PD, the school system who um, allowed us to use their parking lot um, because it made for a really great flow of traffic, um, our long-term care facilities as well. And so here, there's a, a mixture of health department staff, emergency management, um, and long-term care facility staff. Um, same here, a mixture of our environmental health staff, our um, communicable disease nursing staff, and our long-term care facility staff. Um, you can see our nurses starting to don their personal protective equipment. Um, and so the way that this was set up was um, around the other side of the building, if you can imagine that, was a check-in where cars would check in. Their name would be verified, um, that they were on the list and they would come around um, and then their requisition would be placed on their car and then they would come um, up the aisle here. Um, they would be at the first nursing screen station and then um, their collection um, site here. So at this site, um, they were gonna be doing the actual nasopharyngeal um, collection the swab and um, lastly I just wanted to share with you that this um, is um, a photograph of our uh, case investigation and contact tracing command center at the health department um, it doesn't look like it in this picture but I promise you all that tape on the floor and everywhere else is to help us indicate where we can be safely um, in the space together um, and these are all dedicated health department staff who um, do case investigation of all new cases every day and then also follow up with every um, not only every case um, every day for a change in symptoms but um, all uh, close contacts every day for any change in symptoms as well so this is a very busy crew they're also taking in screening and assessment for those who want to be collected for testing um, which I'll talk about in just a second and answering, they do a lot of um, consultation and technical assistance to businesses um, in our community as well through this command center. And lastly, um, I think that's my last slide. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to say that the COVID-19 call center um, to date has seen um, about 2,400 calls um, so far with about 915 being referred to the nurses at the phone bank at the health department. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that we've been working really hard on increasing the access to collection. Um, so we do the collection. We don't actually test at the health department and lots of other providers do collection as well and they don't test necessarily in their facility but then that um, specimen that is collected is then sent to either a private lab or the state lab. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just want to say that lots of partners have been working really hard including Cone Health and ARMC, um, Piedmont Health um, Services and the health department um, to create an additional collection site at Grand Oaks which um, did start on May 13th. Um, the, that partnership was instrumental in creating the criteria for the outpatient collection at Grand Oaks. They launched on May 13th. Um, it is by appointment, so interested individuals can call us at the health department at 227-0101 um, if they are interested in being screened. Um, typically, the criteria is based on symptoms, um, so asymptomatic may not um, actually um, get you screened in uh, but if you are um, interested in it give us a call at the health department and we are happy to screen and assess um, and if meet um, we can refer them by appointment to the grand oaks facility the health department is also um, doing collecting based on screening and appointment uh, when needed um, we've taken on the um, biggest portion of the law the long-term care facility um, pieces of testing uh, or collecting uh, residents and staff and that keeps us pretty busy um, but we also um, collect for the general public as needed as well and I think that's all I have I just want to say many thanks to the many partners um, I won't remember them all but most certainly em emergency management and EMS and United Way um, the community college um, uni the Elon University County um, City um, leadership and the school system I a question for you how many of, you, of the existing health department employees have been dedicated to contact tracing and investigation? And, of, and how many have we had, or have we had to acquire new employees to fill in the gap that Great that question. created? So we've not had to acquire any new employees or um, gone to any contract um, surge capacity. We started off with um, three nurses who were doing um, case investigation and contact tracing and then quickly went to six um, and now we have anywhere from eight to ten given the day um, and those same nurses who are doing the contact tracing and the case investigation are um, there are about four of them that also get deployed for um, collection and so um, if we had a large collection event like we did right. um, anywhere from two to four of them would be deployed for that um, event and um, we still have the capacity to pull from our um, existing staff um, to support any additional cases if we saw a large influx of cases and we're actually starting to explore um, a dyad of teams so having a public health nurse uh, coupled with a, a non-nurse as a support because there's lots of contact tracing that once once our nurses do the case investigation and the initial contact tracing there are lots of folks who are close contacts that may be not as high risk. Right. Right. They're at risk because they were exposed, but they might be fairly healthy. They might be pretty young. And so checking in with them is uh, a lot less taxing than someone who might be a close contact who is over 65 and has some underlying health issues. Right. Like we're going to want to know lots more about that person every day. Um, and so being able to create those dyads so that um, lower level risk is managed by maybe a non-nurse professional. Okay. So we still have some capacity. Thank you. Well, thank you for what you do. Yes, indeed. Thank I you, guys. It. Definitely. Um, so how? So you do have capacity with when your staff now. So you're not groaning like, oh, we got to have more people here. We can't handle the level of work that we have. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. So. Um, days are long and they're tiring so um, you know I want I want to sort of respect and recognize that it is hard work but we do have capacity right now so we have enough staff um, who are doing the contact tracing and the case investigation right now um, and we have enough to to meet a, a, a much larger daily increase if we were to see um, exponential type of increase we might have to start thinking about that but I will say 
uh, County Manager Haygood and City Manager Hardin have both expressed their interest in you know making sure that we have what we need and being able to deploy staff uh, within the county and cities to help with that if we needed that. I talked to Jerry Peterman, the mayor of Graham, this evening, and he also said that the town of Graham is very concerned about that and wants to be sure that uh, the health department has its resources. So we definitely appreciate all of our municipal partners. Um, do you have, or can you think about, I don't need an answer right now, okay. but can you kind of think about what kind of caseload would sort of tip you over? To where it's not as manageable anymore where you need right. we we the county the the people of alamance county um we want to see the health department have the resources that it needs so if you need something we need you to tell us absolutely and when that point comes if you could kind of think about that how many people you have working how many cases what kind of caseload can one dyad bear i see I and wish so, I brought that with you because we do have that figured out. So um, what I can do is I'll put that together for you all and send it to you um, as a as a reply for you. That would be great. And maybe um, if you come back the next meeting, maybe we can talk about that so the public can be aware Absolutely. of that as well. Because we want to be sure that you have the people that you need to do this. Because I think that um, one thing that I hope that everybody can agree on is that the real core help that we can the real core of the problem is identifying the people with the virus and um, testing them and then tracing their contacts and putting them in isolation that whatever else you think about any of the rest of it we can agree that that is critically important to um, to isolate to test and then isolate the contacts of the people who have tested positive so we want to be sure that you have the resources to Thank be able to do that from a financial perspective, too, or are you have you looked at how much overtime you're experiencing right now? And um, I wish wise? I brought those numbers for you. I can tell you, um, I, I think I shared this um, in an email exchange with some others that um, we get um, money every year for general communicable disease right. um, through our state agreement agenda, and it's slightly under a hundred thousand every year. So this year, that was completely spent. Uh, with mumps outbreak and then mm -hmm. um, uh, making sure we prevented a hepatitis A outbreak and then just a routine what we consider routine pertussis and tuberculosis and and other types of communicable diseases that we're always always managing um, and that we continue to manage now even in COVID so that those right. other communicable diseases does, don't stop and so um, those that hundred thousand was spent pretty quickly through um, the first part of the year and then we did receive um, roughly 128,000. It was not CARES Act money um, prior to CARES Act um, right. execution um, that is to go to help uh, support the COVID response. But I can get those numbers for you too okay. um, and um, roughly how many staff members um, are directly and indirectly involved and how many man hours that is. So I'll, I'll make note of that. Thank you. What kind of qualifications does someone need to be a contact tracing person to be part of the dyad? Are these people who, uh, is this an HR problem? If you need to ramp up, if you need to hire people, is it, gonna, is it hard to get them now? You can't, I'm assuming, just pull somebody off the street um, and everybody needs them now. Is yeah. that sort so, of, how long does it take from identifying we need to hire people till getting somebody in the in the, uh, in That's the, a great question. So I will also want to. I just want to mention that the um, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services has also put in a statewide contacting um, contact tracing uh, resource. So just like um, you would ask for resources from emergency management if you needed PPE, if a county finds itself in a in a position where they needed uh, more capacity and didn't have it internally or didn't have it within their own community, they could ask for that resource and um that the groups that are there are two groups that are um under contract for that and they are providing the training for that so internally um it depends on which role the person is playing so if it's that low level contact tracing for someone who um, might not be as um the, his the history might not be as labor intensive um, it's probably a couple of days of shadowing um, making sure that we understand exactly what we're looking for um, and understanding when you're going to defer back to a nurse. 
so as soon as someone says um, we've got someone I, I'm a cl close contact and you're my my tracer and I say well today I feel sort of fatigued it's not that contact tracers job to sort of diagnose that or try to get go any further it's for them to stop and then defer back to the nurse to, to um, who has more of the medical expertise to go through that and so uh, um, and so it's typically a, a couple of days of shadowing someone making sure you understand exactly what you're going to be asking and when you're going to be referring back for that type of contact tracing for the case investigation um, that's typically done by our public health nurses and um, we're very lucky that we have uh, seasoned staff um, and it takes at least 12, 12 months to fully understand communicable disease in the way that we need people to understand it um, and we're lucky that we've done a lot of cross training so much of our nursing staff uh, while they might not do it every day is involved enough um, that when we have to pull them it's a refresher um, of maybe you know half a day to a day and then uh, we're getting them back in there um, to bring them into the uh, case investigation piece which is the most labor intensive um, great mr sutton do you have any questions yes i do uh, but the first one is the 24 that are in hospitals from our county are they in Alamance County hospitals or are they in Greensboro at Cone or what's the situation there? Um, the 21 that are receiving care in the hospital, um, I don't have the breakdown right. for you. For the most part, um, Cone, the Cone system has decided to transfer, transfer COVID positive folks to um, what used to be called Leslie, uh, Wesley Long um, and is now called Green Valley. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. And so, um, Mo most if not all are going to be transferred um to the to that facility um because that's mm -hmm. cone's designated hospital mm -hmm. i may be wrong i think spring valley is the old women's hospital is that not is that not true green valley green valley green valley, green valley. yeah you're correct well you have Wesley long over there off of friendly but you also have uh, the women's hospital which is in spring valley uh, I thought he'd been converted, but okay. Uh, now here's the second question. The CDC, you know, not too long ago, I asked you about what would it take for you to think that we can move forward and open up basically. And uh, you said that it would have to come from a higher authority basically to give you those directive so to speak or something that you can go to fall back on uh did you see where the cdc and it doesn't get much higher than that uh came out at the end of the week with six areas of uh, and how to six areas of what you would look at to open up and move and, and open up our country and economy and civil so on did you have you seen those I've read about them, yes. Uh, the point in case, let me just point out one. And this was in regards to schools. If I may read a small paragraph here. So the purpose of this tool is to assist administrators in making reopening decisions regarding K-12 schools during the uh, pandemic. Screen keeps going away. It is important to check with state and local officials and other partners to determine the most appropriate actions while adjusting to meet the unique needs and circumstances of the local community. And they had three categories of questions. Now this just came out last, what, what day was it? Thursday or Friday? And it said, number one, the first call was, should you consider opening? And it had three points that you were to answer yes or no to. And if it said any no, any no's, do not open. And then it said if all yes, go over to the second category, which was how many questions? Four. Four questions. And if it said any no, meet safeguards first. If all yes, move to the third column. <laughs> and the third column was one, two, three, four, five, six points bullet points 
and it said any no meet safeguards first and then it had a summation it said if all yes across that board open and monitor and if you looked at the categories the questions there wasn't nothing in my opinion that we should not be able to handle not necessarily our school system but that we shouldn't be able to handle and the questions are not the the, the categories of, of introspection are not that um in other words they can be met if if, if you have adequate resources and uh, so with that said what were the other five areas do you, do you remember i didn't bother to look at the other five because i just looked at this this particular category but uh, it was giving guidelines of what we should look at and what we should answer yes or no to as to whether we felt like we should that we could open up and uh, that's coming from the cdc and uh, do you remember any of the other categories no sir i don't have the report in front of me um but to answer, I think okay. you were asking um, how does that decision get made here? And so the document does reference um, consulting with your state um, officials. And here in North Carolina, that guidance and those, those directives are coming straight from the governor's office um, with consultation from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so at a local level, we're charged with you know, um, implementing the uh, communicable disease pieces that we do, um, which are the case investigation, the contact tracing, any mitigation that we can and identify um, any outbreaks, particularly in vulnerable populations. And then we follow the directives um, that the governor and the DHHS um, outlay, um, outline for um, how the state will proceed Right, I understand that. But my question and my point is if the CDC says that you can move forward, if you meet these guidelines, if you choose to, uh, then I'm not sure I wouldn't trust the uh, CDC for my advice rather than possibly, you know, a uh, another source. Let's put it that way. Because surely they're going to CDC, you would assume. They're looking at what the CDC says. I would like to see what the other six categories were. If you have that report, if you could get that to us. But uh, the, the schools, uh, what they required for the schools to open up, in my opinion, everything I looked at was very attainable. Very attainable. And, uh, and I hope you do see that because it was, and that just came out at the end of last week. So, you know, it's not like it was 30 days ago when all this first started or 60 days, whenever. But uh, if you could give us that report, I, I would love to see it. Do you have anything else on to um, any other questions, Mr. Sutton? Oh, no, I'm fine. Okay, Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions or comments for Ms. Saunders? No, uh, good report, and thank you for what you guys do. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, sir. Yes, indeed. All right, does anybody else have anything as a result of the others? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. You. Are you going to stick around for the next item? I can. I can wait. I think that would be good. Thank you. Okay, the next item for discussion is the CARES Act funds for Alamance County, an update on that situation with uh, Mr. Hagan. Thank you, Commissioners, and good evening. Uh, um, hang on just a second. Stacy. I think that you can stay oh. in here. We have 10, so. Not bringing anybody else out? No, no, no. no. So all means stay, please stay. Fine. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, it's all right. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit this evening, Commissioners, about uh, funding that we're slated to receive from the state that's part of the CARES Act. I'm going to go through a little bit of information about what that is and then uh, kind of what we've been up to from county government's perspective and what we're going to be doing uh, here in the very near future, submitting a plan to the state uh, to give them an idea of what we believe uh, might be possible to do with these funds. At this point, I'm going to pass out a hard copy of a potential plan budget for the county's uh, uh, plan that's required to go to the state by June 1. And I've emailed this document to Commissioners Sutton and Commissioner Boswell earlier today. So 
uh, they should have that document too. Do you gentlemen have that email with that document? Yeah, I do. I, am. I do. Okay, great. We'll just get right to it. So uh, there's a lot of information in this PowerPoint, and it's not a lot of graphs. It's all just bullet type info. But uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on, uh, the state received uh, about four billion dollars uh, from the federal government. Uh, to uh, help address the coronavirus uh, efforts in the state of North Carolina. And House Bill 1043 created the Coronavirus Relief Fund and used federal funds from the CARES Act. Uh, in that particular bill, $150 million was allocated to 97 uh, county governments, with each one receiving a base allocation of $250,000 and then a portion of the $150 million based on our population size. And so the state has also created the North Carolina Pandemic Recovery Office, which is a new branch, a new office in state government that's going to be responsible to oversee this funding, to oversee its disper uh, dispersion to counties, and to help counties with guidance on how to properly use the money. And they're using, uh, they're basing their guidance on the Department of Treasury information. And the sheriff for Alamance County government uh, for the Coronavirus Relief Fund is three million seven thousand nine hundred sixty-seven dollars. So that's the share that that we have been allocated to receive to help uh, in the effort in Alamance County to, to fight coronavirus. So uh, as far as the funds themselves go, we have not yet received these monies. We did send in our application on May 11th, so we have applied for the funds. But then we've checked back with the new NC Pro office, uh, and they have told us they did receive our application, but. Uh, as you can well imagine, they are quite busy and they're learning their role and also handling questions and applications from 97 other counties. But we are required by the state to have a funding plan uh, back to the NC Pro office by June 1. This plan uh, that we're uh, required to send to them, it can change later. So the, the, it's, it will be based on, after we talk this evening, uh, probably these numbers that I'm putting in front of you, but it's important for the board to understand we can change our funding plan uh, after June 1, but we do have to have something to NC Pro by uh, June the 1st. And what the state has said is all unspent funding must be returned to the state by December 30th. So after, out of that $3 million, if come December 30th, we have funds that have not been spent, or if we do some kind of a loan program where we're, we get money back, we have to send those funds back to the state. And it's been made clear to us that counties uh, will be responsible for the use of the funds. So if we spend any of this money in our own efforts uh, to address the coronavirus, or uh, we distribute uh, portions of these monies to the cities, or to any nonprofit agency, or to any local business, the county ultimately is responsible to make sure that whoever receives the money spends it properly on uh, actions or materials allowed by the state. And uh, we will be required, county government will, to sub uh, submit reports to the state by October 1st and January 21st detailing where we're at. What have we done? What have we spent? Uh, what, what have we allocated to other entities and what have they done with the money? So the coronavirus relief funds uh, per the legislation have some uh, specific requirements. They have to be spent on uh, expenditures that were incurred due to the public health emergency related to coronavirus. They have to be expenses that were not accounted for in the most recently approved budget. That was as of March 27th. Uh, and they can be for expenses incurred during the period of March 1st, 2020 through December 30, uh, 2020. So as you can see, these funds can be used across two fiscal years, right? We're in fiscal year 1920 now. We've had costs that we have already incurred and we think we're gonna incur some more between now and the end of the fiscal year. And we also have looked at what might we, what costs might we incur next fiscal year. And those are uh, some of the numbers we'll go over on your, on your sheets. And then there are uh, some specific details about what the funding can be used for. This is the, the plan template that the state has developed is based on these six particular uses. You can use the funds to pay for medical expenses, uh, to support public health efforts. You can use the funding for <coughs> payroll, which could be for, uh, if you have employees that are, the state declares substantial, that means they've spent a great deal of their time uh, addressing the coronavirus issue, you can uh, use these funds to help cover their pay, as well as hazard pay uh, for uh, employees that you deem are eligible, meet some criteria that, uh, that makes them eligible for hazard pay. 
Uh, you can use the funding for uh, ac action to facilitate public health measures and expenses associated with the provision of economic support. Uh, this would be where you get into the possibility of doing uh, grants for local uh, businesses or some type of loan uh, program for local businesses. And then any other COVID-19 related expenses. So that's a little bit broad, but again, uh, all of these uses would have to be reviewed by the new NC Pro office and uh, working with our staff to determine are they eligible, are they okay. So to get to the, to the real chase, uh, we have to submit our plan by June 1st. We have received a template uh, from NC Pro for how uh, uh, what, that we'll need to fill out and actually send back. And it, it includes those six approved uses and we have to kind of, for this initial pit plan, we have to estimate what we think we might spend in these different categories. Uh, it is also, so they have the six approved uses and then the state also through the plan template allows for uh, the county to give some thought to and express a desire to uh, possibly distribute funding to municipalities and nonprofits. That's a separate piece from the six, but it is an allowable use. Uh, and again, we think that our initial plan should probably be broad and inclusive as we can make it, knowing that you know, we may change it. I'm sure we will change it after June 1 as we dial in uh, specific costs. Um, and again, our staff will be working with the NC Pro folks to make sure plan stays compliant and any expenditures that we're making. If we distribute any funds, it's for uh, reasons that are compliant by the legislation and any way that we use the money will be compliant also. Can I ask a question? Yes. On the last slide? Yes. Um, so when it includes possible distribution to municipalities and nonprofits, do the municipalities or nonprofits have to use the money for one of those six approved? categories yes okay. yes so we would we would want to make sure if we were going to give any funding to the cities or nonprofits that they tell <laughs> us before we distribute to them this is the particular one of six uses that we're going to use it for okay. well, and two we have uh, a number of agencies providing meals and food to seniors in particular seniors who have been afraid to get out because of this issue so mm -hmm. they might be interested in being able to receive some of that as well yes I believe uh, that would there is a category that that would fall under so that those are uh, we believe applicable there's a lot of you're gonna hear me say you're hearing me say a lot of uh, what we believe is allowable we won't know until the state tells us yes that is indeed an allowable expense so. I know from some of the reports I've seen from the aging committee that some of those organizations are getting federal funds and other sources of funding already themselves as well but there might be some needs there we might need to be aware of. Indeed. So please note, commissioners, that this is an initial funding plan. This is just uh, what we think is possible for county government uh, to do with these $3 million. Uh, what we've seen so far is uh, we're looking at we have spent or will spend by the end of the fiscal year uh, $216,834. That's what we have already spent. Uh, that is for uh, employee salaries that we believe would be substantial for testing and disinfecting, PPE, technology, et cetera. These, this is equipment and pay that we have already put out for uh, costs related to coronavirus up through May 15th. And then we are also estimating another 570,000. Let me ask, let me ask a question. Yes. Before you go forward. So these substantial employees, who are they? Uh, these are health, health staff, mm -hmm. health nurses, I believe some EMS uh, employees are included with that. And uh, there were another couple of categories. I can't remember off the top of my head, but we can uh, provide you with that actual list, but it's mostly health EMS. Um, a couple of DSS employees. That's right. Maybe the emergency management? Yes. Would they be? Emergency so $216,834 thus far up till May 15th. That's what we have tracked as uh, what the county has spent. And we are estimating that we will spend approximately $570,462 uh, for coronavirus related expenses between now and the end of June. That, again, those are our substantial employees. Uh, we're about to really step up our disinfecting of the courts. My understanding is come June 1, uh, courts are going back into full-blown session of some level. We've been disinfecting courts uh, ever since because they've been having levels of court throughout this event. 
Now, one of the main features that is in that $570,000 is the possibility of a hazard pay bonus for ca uh, county employees. Uh, we're estimating that to be a little over 400000 but it's important, commissioners, that you understand. We, haven't, we have not determined any eligibility criteria for that. That is just a very broad net to say what, what would do we think it might possibly cost to give some kind of hazard pay bonus to the folks that have been working this event, uh, really uh, putting themselves at risk. I think once we, uh, once we determine what eligibility criteria we would use, to determine who those folks are, that number will, will change, I would imagine. But that's that's the lion's share of what we see as a potential cost between now and the end of the fiscal year. And then, um, so our total cost for fiscal year 1920 are reflected on your, your budget sheet, $787,295. That is our estimate for what we think we will spend on coronavirus uh, in fiscal year 1920. Then for fiscal year uh, 2020, 21, that would be through J July 1 through De the end of December. We're estimating $2,220,671 uh, for foreseen coronavirus related expenses. Again, most uh, a lot of it is substantial employees. We're going to be spending a, a significant amount of money trying to ensure that our departments and our courts are socially distanced. We're going to be investing in a lot of plexiglass. What I understand right now is that is not the easiest substance to come by. Um, so we're going to be investing in things like that to try to keep the public and our uh, our county employees and our state employees from the court system safe. We're looking at doing various capital modifications to buildings throughout county government and the court system to try to install uh, new uh, windows and shelving and things that we need to try to separate the public from the employees. We're also uh, assuming that we're going to be purchasing new various technology. We're budgeting some of these funds. You can see, I think we budgeted uh, $75,000 to go toward the elections. You know, the elections will hit during this period. We're not exactly sure what we can expect uh, during this upcoming election, but we think it's reasonable to expect that we're going to be doing um, site prep, perhaps, at all the voting locations across right. Alamance County, as well as cleaning before, during, and after uh, the use of these, uh, these properties. Um, our court system, again, uh, to, to clean the courts once they go back to full-blown usage, uh, when they move back into operating all six, seven courtrooms, our cost for that cleaning will uh, increase dramatically, and we'll, we'll have to do that in order to try to keep all the folks that are coming to court and work there safe. We have figured that it is possible we could see another round of hazard pay. We don't know what's going to happen come winter. So it's possible that there would be a second wave of uh, coronavirus. We certainly <coughs> hope not, but if so, we might would want to consider some other level of hazard pay. We would use more than likely the same eligibility criteria that we come up with uh, for the first round in 1920. And then we've also included in this $2.2 million, $800,000 in um, community, community grants which that could be, uh, as you see on the slide, uh, funding to support local businesses or nonprofits or our municipalities. It could be any of those, uh, any of those in combination or solo, it uh, doesn't matter. But it, we have earmarked for the time being $800,000 for that purpose. And again, the $75,000 is kind of a standout, but that's uh, particularly for the elections. Okay, let's pause on the $800,000 for just a second because you've grouped the local businesses, nonprofit, and municipalities. And I know that um, some of the municipalities are concerned about um, their own COVID-related expenses. And as I understand, the reason that you've put those together with that $800,000 is because that's the way the state form is done. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And so it's not just Brian Haygood throwing municipalities <laughs> in the same bucket with businesses and nonprofits. That the reason that you've presented this way is because that's the way the state requires it to be reported to them. Is that right? We will. Yes, we will. We will have to at some point if we decide we're going to disperse funds to nonprofits or uh, the cities or to local businesses through a grant or a loan program. At some point, we will have to say this specific dollar amount you know we're gonna we're gonna allocate for that but uh, one thing that uh, I think would probably be helpful and some of the cities have started doing this now it's not in a uniform manner but uh, providing us with their estimates of what they think their costs are I was gonna ask that yes yeah. so uh, for us to make sure that we stay compliant with the state's requirements and we properly report it 
uh, and I give the commissioners an idea of what we think might be feasible financially to disperse this and these numbers can change they can move about we're not locked into any specific way to spend these funds but this seems to be for an initial plan the, the most appropriate way and the reason that you did the chart the way that you did this is kind of a model off of the state form right that's correct this is so this isn't Brian starting with the empty piece of paper you use the application to the pandemic resource office as your template for coming up with this is yes it? yes the the budget that you see here these these different uh, headliners are uh, approved uses of the funding and these are slots on the um, form but again the economic support uh, we would at some point need to determine if there were going to be a specific dollar amount going to uh, municipalities and nonprofits are in one pile and local businesses some type of grant or loan program for local businesses are in another another block but okay um is it will we mess up your flow with your presentation if we stop for questions on this particular no. screen no. so um commissioner boswell uh i'd like to give you the opportunity first if you want it or if you want to come back to you that's fine with me but do you have uh comments or questions concerns about what you've heard so far uh yeah i do have one on the grants and loans the business stuff I, I mean this is supposed to be a specific fund that really you pretty much spend all of it uh how do you put a loan out to a business and then they have to pay it back i mean a loan is when you give somebody something they get it back to yes that's that's correct we at, at county government we have no experience to my knowledge doing either one of these types of programs either a grant to local businesses in this manner or uh, managing a loan there has been a lot of discussion we've had discussions with the folks from NC Pro about is it constitutional for the county to give grants uh, that the Department of Treasury my understanding is the Department of Treasury guidelines allows for grants to be given but the state has a has a uh, constitutional issue with the county yes given, it's uh, a emoluments clause you cannot give money to a private business you can give a grant for economic development but it has to serve a public purpose they have to invest in the community and have jobs that doesn't help a business that has no money coming in right. so one alternative may be to give them a low interest loan where they pay a small amount of money every month and 24 months later there's a balloon payment right. but uh, will they be in business in 24 months those are the issues I'm wrestling with now so you may not be able to collect anything back but businesses that need funds they need them now they don't need a grant a year from now or two years from now so that's the the constitutional obstacle we have so we cannot just give somebody money well the paycheck Pre preservation program I think is what it was called allowed for the loans to be made through banks who have obviously have experience making loans setting rates collecting unpaid balances um, is that a possibility that we could use a local bank to make some uh, allocate a certain portion of funds to a bank to make these we would still have to make the final approval obviously right. but the bank got to be God, I'm thinking about all the issues that we've gone through with paycheck preservation we've had so many banks being accused of taking care of their existing customers and not taking care of anybody else so mm, that might work better for a large industrial company or a right. larger business but for a restaurant and these are small loans or a obviously. smaller business that's not going to be much assistance to them they're going to need some cash and they're going to need some easy way to pay it back and I think that's again for an initial plan saying that there's a dollar amount and, and again commissioners uh, I'm also listening tonight too to hear if you're uh, think that these these expenditures are reasonable um, if there's an interest in trying to figure out how do you channel any of these funds to local businesses in Alamance County then this it makes sense to have some level of funding earmarked in the initial plan for that and then let us try to figure out how does that actually work is it going to be uh, is there any way possible to structure a grant program it doesn't seem likely uh, that may pan out to not be possible and it could pan out that a loan programs beyond either beyond us to be able to manage or something that would be so 
uh, drawn out perhaps that maybe it wouldn't be timely for the business. I don't know that right now, um, but if if the commissioners agree that trying to get some portion of these funds to th these community groups, which include our cities or uh, businesses or nonprofits, then it makes sense to put it in the initial plan as an allocation to do that. Well, did the bill itself allocate or, or use language that said grants or loans to businesses? Or was it grants or loans perhaps to nonprofits and to municipalities or just to the municipalities? How, how businesses are, my understanding, business loans or grants are allowable with these funds. That's the, that's the federal rule. And then they ran into the North Carolina North Constitution. Carolina Constitution. <laughs> and we are a subrecipient of the federal money through the state. So we are bound by the Constitution. Yeah. And we'll have to figure out a way, and it can be done, but I think first thing you, you need to find out is how much money do these small businesses need to survive? And then cap that and then have some type of minimum qualification. But you're right, you're gonna have to make some financial judgments and I don't know that we have the capability to do that. Well, speaking from experience, it's not always easy and it's not always perfect. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, right. it's so important to get resources out into the community and I think that's really what the CARES Act was um, intended to do is to help push money out into these small businesses, especially the hair salons and uh, barber shops and things. And a lot of the hair, a lot of the personal care industry businesses um, are women-owned, and I think quite a few of them are uh, minority-owned. The barber shops and uh, have a special role mm -hmm. in uh, certain communities. So. Um, so that's really important. I hope that, you know, this is not a problem that's unique to Alamance County. All the other counties are in the same boat that's with right. trying to figure out how to do grants to businesses. So hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to um, put some heads together with people in other counties and figure out some things. Um, Mr. Boswell, do you have, does that, do you have anything else you want to say in addressing that point or do you have another? Uh, no, I'm just sorry. I, maybe I brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, uh, that was a that great was important. Yeah, that was a great question. Only. It was. That was a really important point yeah. and a great question. And it's um, also important to remember that each dollar that we put toward a uh, government expense is one less dollar that goes out to a business or a nonprofit. So we um, all need right. to be really aware of okay, that. Okay, well. I'm sure that we'll see more guidelines with this in the future, right? I hope so. I think we all hope so. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sutton, do you have any um, points or questions or concerns? Well, when I initially read some of the uh, parameters here on this, I don't know where I saw it, and I can't get my finger on it, but it said that... Uh, <sighs> that this process was optional to some degree as to who handled it and so forth. Um, and that's all I can remember and that's awfully generic, I know, but are you familiar with any options as far as how this was to be handled? The, uh, are you talking about the grant, the possible small business assistance? No, no all the money, all, all, the, uh, all the CARES provisions. So. Again, I understand the legislation has allocated uh, these funds specifically to counties, and uh, I think the, the reasoning was counties are often on the front lines of the health, uh, the, the effort through the health department in particular to, to fight these pandemics, and then to allow the county to uh, work with other resources in their own in its own county to figure out the best way to distribute these monies out. So uh, I'm not aware of an option to to give the money to someone else to make these decisions. I think um, there is no, to my understanding, there's no requirement to distribute any of the money to any other entity. But uh, I think you know there's it does, as the chair mentioned, make some uh, good sense to to think about. How can you use some of these funds to uh, help help uh, others in our community too? Now, is the sheriff still there? Yes, he <laughs> is. Can he? Uh, can I address a question uh, to him and/or to to Brian? Uh, I also read that some of the money could be used to purchase. Uh, 
for I, I, I can't think of the better the best word, but for for lack of uh, the perfect choice um, equipment for the uh, for law enforcement that uh, was pretty much based on uh, what would be needed if you had to handle civil disobedience or or whatever uh, if things you know went south. Uh, can can he comment on that, or Brian? Can you? I'm I'm not aware of that. Uh, it's possible that uh, I, I am. I do know that you can spend money on, uh, and we've included this in our in our plan here for uh, particularly for uh, maintaining. It's, it's the state calls it maintaining prisons, but I think what we would be looking at is enhanced cleaning and disinfectant that's needed at the detention center. So uh, th that's really been the extent I think of our of our consideration for how these funds might be used in a law enforcement perspective has been primarily limited to uh, extra cleaning and disinfecting at the jail. So. And, if, and if you have an outbreak in the jail, if you have to hospitalize somebody, you can use it for that too. Yeah. That's good. That's good to know. Sheriff, do you have anything to add about that? Yes, sir. Well, I had a question of about the jail. So looking at the sheet, it doesn't look like We've got expenses for maintaining prisons is a slot, and we've got anticipated costs for next year of sixty thousand dollars. But we don't have any existing costs. Did you have have you had to use buy PPE out of the sheriff's department budget, or is that accounted for in another part of this? We we bought shields and uh, masks. Did you just pay for those out of your budget? You has that been included and in it's possible that that's been included in the ppe purchase because i know we did uh sheriff was able to help us get some additional masks for some other departments too that we paid for through the em department so i know em has worked very hard to try to just uh collect all this data uh, that as we've been spending and get it in one place so i'll i'll be sure to check on that but I, susan I, says it is okay. So. Gotcha. okay great mr sutton anything else No, I can't put the phone on silent. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will say this. I will say this. What I had read could very well have been just off the wall, but it was more than just inside the jails. This this was street equipment and uh, what I had read. And I just wondered if that's possible. It, it may very well be possible. I'd, I'd be hesitant to say that I know for certain that it is uh, like much of this uh, we're going to be relying on the, the state office to make sure that we're spending the money correctly so it, it might be possible I'm not aware of a consideration to purchase anything like that for for county purposes do the do the the, the, the uh, sheriff's cars have a shield between the, the driver and the back seat some do some don't that would be an idea to because I've been there, Terry, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, things happen. In the front seat or the back seat? The what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm talking about dangerous things. People. <laughs> the things that people can do. It's Tim, I'll, I'll, Tim, I'll research that, but I don't know if anything you know, has been said for that. But I know there's a lot of civil disobedience uh, involving this virus and opening of the different things around the state and they may have thrown that in there uh, i don't know but i haven't heard of it all right what about you okay well, that, was my, that was my question thank you thank you mr lashley no that's that's, that's one of the things that concerned me because i remember being on the police department and the things with, that people do that you arrest is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You just can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Can you, Terry? It's unbelievable. You're right. And you can't do now what we could do when I was on. <laughs> we used to beat the hell out of them. But you can't do that now. Um, well, well, well. <laughs> okay. the, Mr. Carter? Right. The, the more I think about a, the grant and loan issue the more I think it makes if, it, if there were a way to make it happen it make more sense for it to be a grant because as, as uh, Mr. Albright just recognized you, you make a loan to a small business and they don't survive after this for two more years or for 12 months and then you can't collect it and right. if you make it in a loan then theoretically we're responsible for paying the state back 
yes. for funds that we can't collect. And if the money's got to be used and documented before 1231, then we wouldn't know that the, mon that the funds had been used or that the loans, have, the loans would not be repaid. So it makes more sense to me, it sounds like it makes more sense anyway, to make it as a grant so we can document that it went out. But then you've got to- He said it can't be a grant, right? Well, that's what he said. Can't do no, a grant can't be now, but the Constitution to give money for from a government agency to a private entity, unless you're increasing the tax base or or producing jobs, uh, and that's the Moretti case from 1999. I don't still Economic know that we've got the capacity to try and go through the process of analyzing a loan request. Yes, I, th I think I, I, I would have to agree from a, just a, a logistical perspective. Right. A grant program would be better, uh, you know, unless a, uh, someone has that model already put together or is already working on some constitutional way that we're not aware of. Uh, there know. may be some ways to do it. The, the city of Greensboro, the city of Charlotte, they have uh, business development offices and they may have a way to analyze and do this so we won't have to reinvent the wheel. Now, Guilford County got, idea. I think, 90-something million, is that correct? Yes, they did. And they have this same issue. Some some portion of that money can be used in the form of grants or loans to municipalities, mm -hmm. You may want to small think about businesses. your local Chamber of Commerce assisting in some of this, too. If, they really if don't that's have the possible. capacity to do a loan. Just for purposes yeah. of discussion, I think that's an option. Mm -hmm. They're familiar with local businesses that are members and their needs. Well, thank what if it wasn't money? What if it was an item? Like, what if the county were able to procure a bunch of PPE or disinfectant type stuff and businesses could come pick that up? And it wouldn't be, it's not as nice as a check right. where you can use it for whatever, but it's better than the poke in the eye and um, maybe it would help them, hmm. you know? Well, I mean, I don't. I don't know. A lot of businesses that I frequent have not been open for 90 days. I'm thinking of yeah, lunch, they need money. lunch places, yeah. and uh, they need cash. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. They've and got plenty of masks and gloves. Yeah. They need cash. Most small businesses, you take eight hundred thousand dollars, we could go through that in a New York minute. I mean, it's just it's gone. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, by working and collaborating with uh, other people in other parts of the state, we can figure out how to turn the key in the lock and get it to happen. Um, so did you have anything else? I had a few questions. So um, with the testing, I think we had, Stacy a question at the last meeting about testing and who pays for the tests. So a lot of them, if I remember right, are paid for for uh, private health insurance and Medicaid. Um, is there value what or what is the value, if any, in out, in us budgeting for tests out of the COVID relief funds? So, um, testing gets done several different ways, and sometimes, like you said, um, it's going to be submitted for insurance claims. Um, if criteria is met for state lab submission, then typically that there is no cost to the actual individual. But that those are the highest risk and highest priority. And so, um, in addition to so. In addition to the actual cost of the test, which is done at a testing facility, there is the, um, the cost that is incurred through the actual collection. And so um, as you think through that, um, it's not just the cost of the test, which would be incurred at, or which would happen at a testing facility with reagents and those types of supplies, but also the PPE that um, folks who are collecting it and the actual collection um, supplies like the MP, the nasopharyngeal swabs, the viral media, those types of things. Um, I do think in House Bill 1043 there was um, also mention of testing, um, and I think I'm unclear if this allocation is specifically um, for the um, counties or if it came out of those other buckets that the mm -hmm. 1043 were in, but in those large buckets that 1043 had, um, there was uh, designated money for testing and collection, um, and I'm not sure if that's going to be separate than this or if that money came in over. Um, so that's unclear at this point. And I've, I've got a slide, uh, maybe after this one, that uh, talks about some additional potential funding sources that we think might be coming in. Uh, I think it addresses that. Okay. 
Um, I want to emphasize from my personal point of view how important I think the hazard pay is that we have the uh, health department nurses have been working around you know constantly it's been so you know they've been so diligent and um, just to get and also the the people in Alamance County government who have been going into situations where there's no presence of the virus like the long-term care facilities like the um, EMTs who had, had to go in and put hands on a patient and transport that person and then take off the PPE and go home to their own families and not really have a certainty that they're not bringing right. the virus home with them. And our EMS community in Alamance County has been through a tremendous amount aside from COVID in the past few months and um, they, deserve, they deserve higher pay to start with. I wish that, you know, it, it wasn't hazard pay, it was just a raise. But that's the, you know, we have the sales tax crunch and other budgetary problems. But um, I think it's really important to recognize the service and the sacrifice that they and the emergency management people give to our community. And it's also really important that the public remembers that these are uniquely county-centered or county uh, functions of government that these are not these uh, health department employees the emergency management people the EMTs they work for every jurisdiction in Alamance County <clears throat> so even though you know this wouldn't be a, something going directly to a municipality the people who live in the municipalities benefit directly from that money so um, it's not just the people who live outside the municipalities right. and the ETJs who benefit from the health department. That's a good point. That's true. So that's really important. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, the disinfecting the courts is um, so incredibly important. And people, I think, uh, I guess the general public doesn't really have a reason to get them, you know, get into those weeds about who pays for what with the court system. We don't pay for the employees of the court system. The county does not. Those are paid by the administrative office of the courts. <clears throat> but we do pay for the facilities and their upkeep and we're responsible for keeping them clean and I understand that uh, possibly June 1st they might be reopening the court system which is desperately needed um, and so they're going to I'm sure try to do the social distancing but still you've got people um, and we know that the virus has a higher impact on lower income people and generally people who are involved with the court system tend to be lower income and so you just have a have a situation there where we really need to take very seriously keeping the courts um, as clean as possible and as safe as possible. And I, I would commend our facilities folks. I think uh, you know the courts have been running in a reduced capacity for the past what two months, uh, but our folks have worked very diligently to try to make sure that the the court rooms, all the chambers and offices, restrooms all the pop, uh, common areas in the court building stay uh, clean and disinfected so i was talking to our da today they're going to be use, using every courtroom in the county here including the courthouse in the circle wow yes. there's going to be more courtrooms going to have to be disinfected that's, right. that's a lot of work and then um i also <clears throat> wanted to thank you for including the seventy five thousand dollars for the election process in there because we're going to have an election in November, and um, you know we're going to need a bunch of Lysol wipes to wipe down the equipment that everybody comes in and touches it. Got to clean it between the people, marking the X's on the pavement and in the um, telling people where to go, how far apart to stand from each other, and um, it's going to be a tremendous job. And possibly, I don't know if you're going to have to hire more people to wipe down the machines and all of that. So I think that's very, very wise to uh, consider the election and how to have a safe election where people feel, um, of course we don't have, nobody in this room has power to say how we're gonna vote or what that's actually gonna look like, but it would be very nice if the people who vote in Alamance County could know that they, they're safe when they go to vote because county government is taking care of keeping it, um, keeping the virus down. Absolutely, yes, I, I believe that's gonna be a, uh, a significant cost and a lot of effort. I can't remember off the top of my head how many voting locations we have in the county, but there are 37, I think. 
It's, it's a lot. 37. 37. 37. So 37. So we'll be, I'm, I'm certain we'll be responsible in a lot of cases to make sure that they're, they're clean and ready to go and that our staff that work them are protected. We count on those folks uh, and they're, you know, for all these years they've been willing to be out there and uh, serve as judges and, and precinct officers. So we're, we count on those folks to, to be willing to, to meet that call, to, get a, to have a good election. So. Well, the people that step up to serve in those capacities too uh, are already stretched. So we're probably having to, gonna have to look at, in addition to equipment and material to keep it clean, we're gonna have to look at some additional personnel in those sites. Probably, to, uh, probably so. Do the cleaning because of the people we have are running people through to vote just as quickly as they can. And again, I, I think it's important to remember that these numbers are tentative. They're, they're kind of placeholders. So it could be that as we get closer to elections, we're finding that we're not spending funding in one area and the elections right. are going to cost more than seventy-five thousand dollars. Or we're able to say, well, we need to. This is going to be much more expensive. These are initial estimates based on what we believe are allowable costs and what we think it might actually cost. So very, very early, very tentative uh, numbers. I have one more um, question um, on the sheet where you talk about. Um, is this the right time to ask this? The compliance with COVID nineteen with technology broadband expansion laptop software uh, is that a category which would also apply to any of the municipalities because um, most of the things that we've been talking about I mean the municipalities have had to get PPE and plexiglass and they've had to disinfect and stuff like that which I guess is why you know they're included in that eight hundred thousand dollars but as far as payroll expenses, we're talking about substantially dedicated employees who are ones who work specifically in county-oriented uh, occupations, hazard pay for people who are in specifically county-oriented jobs, and I guess the same for overtime pay, people who are in, in things that the county does and municipalities don't do. But municipalities also, I'm sure, have problems with technology and broadband and laptops and software. So they would be looking at um, taking that out of the whatever part of the $800,000 that they get. Yes, we, we for the purposes of an initial plan, we've looked at the $800,000 as being a potential dollar amount to be dispersed to, to cities uh, and, and, and these other groups. So I, we had really looked at the $153,000 for technology to be focused primarily on county government. Uh, you know, what we've seen, and Bruce might be able to help me speak a little bit to this, uh, we've had to make some investments in uh, particularly our pipe, our broadband pipe to try to, you know, we've had so many people now teleworking and are using uh, uh, internet to do their jobs and we had to expand the county's internet capability. And I'm trying to talk about something that Bruce knows a lot more about. Bandwidth coming into the county for um, for telework um, and for the public access too because of the more traffic there. We have been preparing for a while before this happened to go to more of a mobile workforce. So when a when a desktop would come up, kind of say, you know, desktops and laptops, you don't need both. Why don't you just choose a, a laptop? So we've been heading in that direction, and uh, we've been relatively lucky in that a lot of laptops that were supposed to go back we held on to there's a laptop shortage and those kinds of things so yes we've had to increase teleworking the people that could work from home we did that which means we had increased licenses for the VPNs which are the connections outside into the county and of course for on that highway coming in and out of the county for all those users public and you know internal um, to do that and then just different things for different emergency services folks and those kind of things so yeah it's uh, we had to jump 10 years into the future in about a month one thing I would <laughs> add is uh, Bruce's group have had to really work more closely with the court system I think in the past two months than they uh, on a technology front you know we are primarily the buildings and 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 taking care of those facilities but and and IT has been pretty much left to the state in the past but I think what we've seen is the county's having to become more and more involved in trying to help make sure the court system has the IT resources that they need to do their work and their work is heavily dependent on technology so uh, I know Bruce's folks have been working with judges and clerk and uh, four judges 
so far, you know, go from being in person to being online. That's been a challenge, but we offered our services. We had some really good folks giving good advice. Yeah. We're here to help, that's all. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Sutton or Mr. Boswell, do you have any more questions or comments based on the things that you've heard? Well, I would like to make a comment to uh, Ms. Saunders. While we were on hold here, I was looking. When she said Spring Valley, I thought, you know, that didn't sound right. Because I don't know where Spring Valley Shopping Center is. They have a good restaurant there. But uh, Green Valley. It's Green Valley. Green Valley. It's Green Valley. Yeah. And that's where the old, I'm sorry? Yes, that's where the women's hospital is. Yeah, that's what I said, Green Valley, right. Yeah. I knew what you meant. Yeah. I couldn't understand what you were saying. No, Green Valley is where the women's hospital was, and uh, they closed it, and they moved everybody to a new facility, so it appears that they're taking that building, and it said Moses Cone was moving all their patients over there, and mentioned uh, Greensboro News and Record did an article about a month ago, and it was talking about how uh, Alamance was, uh, and it mentioned Alamance Regional, it mentioned uh, Annie Penn, which is in Reedsville, and there was a third hospital involved but it's uh, green valley and it's the old women's hospital evidently they're going to convert over to taking the, uh, the patients that we're referring to uh, in part at least okay mr boswell do you have anything else based on what you've heard no just look forward to seeing what happens works out okay so next slide <laughs> <laughs> So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are aware of additional funding sources besides this uh, $3 million that the county's been allocated out of the $150 million from the state. Uh, House Bill 1043 allocated an additional $150 million from the state. Uh, we understand that that is being held in reserve. Uh, it will be distributed to counties if counties experience revenue shortfall from COVID-19 and if uh, Treasury uh, or Congress changes guidance and allows those funds to be used for revenue replacement so our understanding is right now those funds are uh, are not being distributed but the state uh, does have them and it will let us know when it's eligible and when we can apply I, I'm, I imagine what we would have to do is demonstrate that we have experienced actual revenue losses and then apply to the state based on how much revenue we actually lose so, so would uh, the implication be that, that would be a comparable amount to the amount that we're receiving this time uh, it's, distribution it's not, I, I'm not aware of the distribution formula that they would use to, to send those out. I don't know. Um, I think this might speak to uh, what Ms. Saunders mentioned about uh, the additional funding in House Bill 1043. If I read it right, I believe it's around $145 million for health costs that will be administered through DHHS. So there are funds that are uh, out there and will be coming. I don't believe any of them have actually been distributed yet. I think DHHS is working on the same kind of stuff we're working on, how to allocate it, what are the appropriate uses, those kind of things. But another another uh, allocation of funding that should be coming down and hopefully the not too distant future. And the health department has received, as uh, Stacy mentioned, uh, a little over $128,000 uh, from public health preparedness and response. And I believe uh, we're starting to work through some of that funding now, uh, but that's some additional funding for coronavirus uh, costs. And then uh, last check, the HEROES Act, I believe it had been passed by the U.S. House. And uh, I think that number is correct, $3 trillion. That's a lot of money. I'm not, I don't know if I, I think I got that right. It's a relief package. And uh, from what I understand, cities and counties, if that actually passes, uh, may be able to use some funding from the HEROES Act for revenue replacement also. So there are, we're trying to watch other funding sources too, see what else might be coming down the pipe. Um, but as for right now, what we know of, we have not yet received our $3 million. We have applied. It's not here yet. Uh, in fact, I think the um, next, uh, next uh, slide to kind of tries to describe a timeline, what a timeline might look like for this particular $3 million. Uh, you know, I, the board doesn't have to vote this evening to approve this initial plan, but I'm hoping to hear if you have issues with what we've put together thus far, you know, you would, you would let us know. And uh, if not, if there's no uh, real hangups with what we put together, we're gonna go ahead and fill out our template and send that form uh, down to the state office. And then we hope in all this coming up very soon, we would start this uh, tomorrow. Uh, we hope within the next few days, we'll actually receive our um, dollars, our $3 million from the state. 
And once we do that, we'll be coming back before the board in June, I would imagine, hopefully June 1, with a budget amendment to actually put those funds into our budget. So at that time, uh, we hope we will have these numbers refined. Maybe we'll have a little better idea about uh, loans and grant programs. Is, are those things possible? Um, uh, we'll continue to refine our numbers for 1920 costs as well as what else might be more and reasonable to allocate for 2021. And we'll work on, uh, in the month of May, we'll be working on identifying some eligibility criteria for hazard pay uh, for county staff. And in May, what, uh, as I say, we've been receiving kind of ad hoc uh, estimates from the municipalities to try to give us an idea of what they've seen so far as costs and what they think they might see next fiscal year. Uh, what I would do is reach out to them and provide them with some a more uniform report form that they could fill out and uh, send back to us so we will know this is the dollar amounts and these are uh, the uses that they've either already had or projected they will have. Would you think, do you think you might use something like this, like the form, give them the same form that the state gave you and let them fill it out with their categories and justifications? Yes, I think that would be helpful if, if, if the county does distribute funds to the municipalities. We, we're going to be responsible to make sure that they you know, spend it, and I'm sure they would, but they would spend it the way that uh, is compliant with the state's guidance. So we would want to start that discussion with, here are the guidance, here's the form that we use. Tell us what you're seeing in the same language that we're speaking to the state. So. Is nope. there a definition that you know of from the state about what is a substantially dedicated employee? We had asked that question. I think that they were working on that definition. Uh, Susan, I know, had been yeah. uh, involved in that talk too. We haven't received any formal guidance. Um, it's a question that lots of counties and municipalities are asking is what is <laughs> considered substantially. Um, if it's going to be that it's going to be left up to the county. We are looking um, preliminarily, you know, someone who has dedicated a majority of their time. It would not be someone who has worked 25% on a COVID-related event. It would definitely be substantial. I think the, the estimate for the budget that we used was 75% of, of time. So if we had employees that were working 75% at least of their time, I think that's correct. But again, we'll, we'll regroup if we get formal guidance from the state that says it's 50 or 80 or whatever we'll we'll apply that that standard so we're not using the we're not considering the planning department or inspections no or the tax department <laughs> no. to be substantially dedicated employees and even if they have to work from home or work in shifts like uh the planning director comes in one day and then somebody else comes in another day so they're not in the office at the same time that doesn't mean that they're substantially dedicated. No. It's somebody whose professional job duties are related to COVID stuff at least 75% of the time. That's correct. So we're going to be required to certify that these funds have been used appropriately on 1231 or by January 1? Yes. But no one will have an audit, so if we distribute money to the community municipalities, they aren't going to have an audit in December. And if they did have an audit in December, how would we ascertain how quickly could they get an audit at a six month point? I think these are these are all excellent questions that we're going to be asking the NC Pro folks because, uh, you know, it's one thing if it's the county spending the money, uh, if we give it to any other entity, we're going to want to make sure from the state, what do you need from us? to demonstrate that the entity that we have funded has done what they were supposed to do with it. And if that's receipts, uh, copies of payroll uh, information, whatever it could be, it depends on the use that the city or the nonprofit or the business said they wanted to do. Um, I, I'm sure we would wind up going with whatever the state recommended, but I, I, I agree, I don't, I don't necessarily think it'd be possible for, a, for an audit to, uh, to, be, to be complete. Let me ask this, um, what about somebody in the, maybe this is too detailed, um, maybe you can't answer it tonight but what about somebody in the IT department who's been working with the court system maybe their regular job is doing I don't know whatever the heck you IT people do you know making sure that uh, hackers don't break into the system or something or helping county commissioners who can't get their lap or their iPad to work and stuff like that so um so suppose you got somebody in the IT department who has shifted over and has been really helping the court system to get their 
act together and be able to manage the WebEx and all of that. Would that person be considered a substantially dedicated employee because their career field is not COVID related, but because of the virus, their work duties turned out to be during the time of the virus, very virus related. Can you answer that? Yes, please. Okay. Um, it could possibly be that we could allocate their time. When this whole COVID um, incident started, we were able to, in our time tracking um, software, in activate a EM activation code. So any employee at the time that they are working on COVID related issues, they're able to allocate their time of the day to that. So what we've been able to do is go back and run reports of who had that EM activation code on their time sheet. And from there, I'm able to pull in the hours that they worked that week and compute it based upon the entire hours that were worked to formulate whether they were substantially dedicated that week versus just eight hours here. And then they may not have worked on any other related incident during that week. So it would have to be 75% of their time mm -hmm. yes, for them to qualify. And I did not mean to sound flippant or disparaging mm -hmm. of the IT department. <laughs> I'm in awe of people who know how to make computers work. It's, I just don't even... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. That's I right. Think, uh, I think one, one, you know, another point to make t this evening is there is a finite amount of money. We only have three million seven thousand and some odd dollars. So once particularly once we determine if there's a there is a dollar amount we're saying eight hundred thousand dollars in a in a initial plan estimate right that to dis disperse either to businesses or cities or or nonprofits once we formalize that then you know we would be committed to that dollar amount going to cities or wherever so we might not be able to claim that that IT person 75 percent simply because we would only have a certain dollar amount to work within. So, uh, you know, one, I think once we we declare that we're promising a certain dollar amount to an outside agency, we would want to stick with that's the dollar amount we give them, and we work around that dollar and and only only look at making sure we're we're adequately and accurately applying our costs. So. Well, I'm not trying to be a devil's advocate, but. From the perspective of IT, that person is not physically in danger of exposure to the virus, right? Hey. right. So would not the substantially dedicated person be a person who was on the line, so to speak, exposing themselves at risk to the virus versus the county getting reimbursed for the time of the individual? I think that's the difference between hazard pay mm -hmm. Which you're talking about with the person who's um, right. in danger. That's hazard pay. Okay. And we're talking about substantially dedicated employees. Uh, okay. People who, if they, they could be, uh, their sal their payroll would be able to be augmented by the CARES Act. That's what I was thinking, right. Okay. I, uh, I didn't follow that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I must have said it wrong. Okay. Um, so we will we will be reaching out to the to the cities and asking them to provide us with uh, their cost estimates and give them a timeline to do that. We'll be asking for it very very quickly. Um, then in June, uh, we hope by June to be able to have an answer uh, for grant a grant program versus a loan program. Is some other county doing this? Uh, are there options to use other uh, entities to do it? Um, is it constitutional for the county to do it? Has it been determined finally that there's no chance it must be loaned? We hope to have an answer for those kind of questions. Um, and if, if we, uh, for however we distribute these funds, whether it's to cities or any other entities, we're going to put something together internally to make sure that uh, we've got staff dedicated to making sure they get the distributions out, that there's a level of accountability and we get back whatever we need from the entity that receives the money so we can prove to the state that we're uh, doing what we're supposed to do with the funds. And then if we if we do get into the grant loan business from uh, uh, for working with businesses, then we would be looking at, and this is very aggressive and optimistic, the possibility of trying to do some kind of put out the call for if someone wants to apply for a grant where we would have come up with these are the criteria, these are the types of businesses that could apply, this is the dollar amount, uh, here's what the loan app, I mean the grant or loan application would look like. Uh, I agree with you, Commissioner Carter, I think to do this for a loan program would be extremely difficult. Uh, so it may be that it, it would turn out to be 
more applicable to grants if that can be done. But uh, we would we would have to try to start putting together some type of process for how do you solicit that, vet it, make sure that the folks that are applying for a grant from the county for these funds uh, are uh, needed and are going to use it in an appropriate way. And then uh, if, if that occurred, we would probably be looking at some time between July and November over that time period of actually distributing funds out to, um, this is if it is uh, business and nonprofit uses. Well, you kind of would have thought some of the guys serving in our legislature who have law degrees might have at some point studied the North Carolina Constitution and know that might create an issue. Well, I think my understanding here was the it was a conflict between the U.S. Treasury uh, guidelines and the and the state. So it's, uh, you know, I think there were three counties I believe that are not having to work through the new NC Pro office. I think they got their funding directly. White, Guilford, and Mecklenburg. Yes, and uh, I, I think they're going to be they may be working um, more with the Treasury, but I think they'll, I'm sure they'll fall under the constitutional requirements for counties also. So. Um, hmm. I think that's the 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 end of my presentation, the end of my information, and I guess what I'm interested to know is do the commissioners believe that these groupings of dollars for an initial plan uh, seem reasonable to the board? No way. I do. I do. And I do. And I do. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I'll make a, if a motion. We don't need a motion. Don't need a motion. Just, okay. This is just for uh, consent and guidance. Yes, we'll we'll uh, we will plan to submit our initial plan based on this this outline, and then uh, we'll start implementing some of these timeline things. And uh, as I say, continue to refine our costs and reach out to our uh, municipal partners too. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a very good presentation and a good discussion. Okay, next on the agenda is RHA Health Services contract extension. Thank you. Uh, so we, we have been working with RHA for mental health crisis service uh, since for many years now. Uh, they provide a place for folks in Alamance County to go if you're having a mental health uh, crisis need, as well as they provide follow-up type services. Um, we pay for these services with our maintenance of effort funds. These are monies the commissioners will, will recall. Uh, we are required by law to spend on mental health service. And we've been spending them with RHA for a number of years. Our current contract expired. We had, uh, we had done a six month renewal of the contract with RHA. It expired December 31st. So we've been running on uh, just extensions for the past couple of months. We were actually doing an RFP uh, put out to see whether uh, any other vendors interested in this uh, project interested in providing the service not because we had any issues with RHA but because we're getting very close to this diversion center type model so the idea was we should pick somebody who uh, can continue to provide the service and we'll be happy with RHA has been very good they were selected as the preferred vendor um, we need to renew this contract with RHA uh, until June 30th and the cost for the uh, six month of service is five hundred forty two thousand eight hundred and five dollars Again, uh, commissioners, these funds are maintenance of effort funds that we must spend on mental health services. So um, what we need this evening is for the commissioners to approve the contract. And uh, I, believe, I believe it requires uh, that you give me authority to sign as this particular contract is be, uh, beyond my ability to sign. And I will say, too, that, um, and I don't think I have the flyers with me, but um, oh, the RHA is preparing to take their service to um, seven days a week. Uh, for 12 hours a day, which is great. They're doing that at no additional cost to the county. They're, they have worked with Cardinal Innovations to figure out a way to bill for that. So now uh, mental health crisis service, it had been available Monday through Friday, eight to eight. It's now going um, through. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. I think the, as y'all know, the sheriff's been a, a leader in trying to uh, extend these mental health crisis services to the Alamance County residents. And this yes. is great news. And that begins uh, June the 6th. So. All right, so we would need a motion to approve the contract and to and for um, the county manager to sign it. So moved. Second. 
So we have, thank you, Mr. Carter and Mr. Lashley. We have a motion by Mr. Carter and a second from Mr. Lashley to approve the contract and for Mr. Haygood to sign it. Uh, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. Next item on the agenda is a Kronos contract renewal. Susan Evans is our finance officer. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Before you tonight is the renewal for our Kronos contract, which will be for fiscal year 2021. Back on October 4th, 2016, um, it was approved for the county to enter into a contract with Kronos for our workforce timekeeping system. This will be our second year um, of a renewal and this coverage will be from July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Our renewal cost is $101,736.29, which is a small increase of $3,912.94. May I ask a question, please? Of course. <clears throat> Make sure you can hear me. I don't know where I was that day or that night, but I don't remember this at all. Um, now, how much is this per year, or is it a, what did you say, a four-year period so, or a one-year period? So this would be a one-year period, um, Commissioner Sutton, and this is a renewal cost of $101,736.29. What that covers is a workforce timekeeping system for all 1,200 of our employees, as well as support that we receive, our manager's license that help um, monitor that, as well as our time clock systems that we have. This program is um, what they consider SaaS or cloud-based, which means that we are paying Kronos to house that information. We do not have to pay for servers or additional computer equipment. Um, they are providing that service for us as well. Next year, this time, what will we what will we be looking at? Um, we are looking at a couple of changes um, next year with some different implementations. So it could even be a cheaper contract. We can evaluate it at that time. So in theory, this could be a hundred thousand dollars a year. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, I need to check see where I was the day we voted on this four years ago because I just don't remember and I won't support this. So uh, I just had to ask the question. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions or concerns? I, I, just a question. Um, have we had any issues with this since we've been put it in effect? Um, we had one issue a couple of years back where their servers did go down, um, but we also have within that agreement, Commissioner Boswell, that when we lose service and it interrupts us for an extended period of time, that they reduce our bill for that cycle by the outage days that they consider. Um, other than that, we have had no issues and no problems with Kronos. Okay. And is there any other alternatives for this? I mean, um, we put what, this. What, what, <laughs> <laughs> what would we do? No, I completely understand. Um, if it were to be the board's pleasure next year, we would have to put this out as an RFP, which is what we did when we went with Kronos. Um, we put it out as a, a request for proposal. Um, they were the best match for us at that point in time. There are some other software companies out there, and if it were the pleasure of the board, we would put it back out as a um, request for proposal next fiscal year. Okay, very good. May I ask one more? Eddie, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm good, go ahead, I'm fine. Where are they based out of? Uh, let's see, I have that information. Um, the contract renewal, let's see, is Massachusetts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other discussion? Uh, explain to me what what that that process do what they do so what they do for us um, if you come into the front door you'll mm -hmm. notice there will be a little time clock on the side of the doorway there and our employees were able to link it with their badge they are able to sign in sign out with that time clock um, that also helps us to manage our absentees 
so when we're having sick accruals as well as vacation time accruals it helps us monitor our overtime we are able to program we're able to use it when we have an emergency activation like we are with covid we're able to track employees time as to how much is being dedicated to a certain event um, it's very helpful when we are having to submit fema reimbursements mm -hmm. and we're having to show fema as well as i know we will with these coronaviruses uh, relief funds is that we will have to show a timesheet right. that proves this is the time that was dedicated um, so it helps us be prepared for those audit it also helps us manage our departments our supervisors department heads can go in look at someone's um, time that they're requesting if they have the time there and they can start really seeing patterns that if we have an employee who is abusing time then they're able to have a resource to go ahead and catch it and address the issue. So this this system, correct me if I'm wrong, so it's replaced. Uh, a, we were paper based until 2016. So That's if you correct. wanted to take time off, or use sick leave, or submit your uh, your monthly uh, mm -hmm. time sheet, it was all done via paper. So we're this has become like our. Uh, it's integrated with our financial software. This is how we do payroll. How we calculate people's uh, paychecks. It's. It's yes. pretty key to our operation. It yep. is, and I will expand on what Brian said, is beforehand, we were completely paper. Um, an employee would put down eight hours. If they took four hours off of vacation, they would have four hours work, four hours vacation. This helps us pinpoint and track time more effectively and more efficiently. Have we looked at uh, <clears throat> what sort of savings manpower savings that created from going from paperless to or from going to a paper process can, to an electronic we can definitely look at that and get a figure back for you on that um, I will say that it is definitely a time saver because of being able to program the what we call the allocations of time that being vacation time sick time um, that is now an automated process when an employee requests time if the time is not there then they're not able to take time right. so there have definitely been great benefits for moving to an electronic system off of the paper system you think it well if you haven't looked you wouldn't know but i wonder if it, we might have saved more than it cost but i don't know it, it would probably be difficult to say it's uh it it has uh, completely revolutionized how we do business when it comes to payroll and timekeeping, um, and for in a in a much better way. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be it would be really difficult to return to paper. I think uh, going back to uh, to paper, but it's it is feasible uh, to consider putting this back out for big. Kronos is uh, one of the biggest. I think Susan, correct if I'm wrong. I think they're one of the largest companies uh, in in America, possibly the world. And it was really important for us too that this, that Kronos uh, works with Munis, which is our financial software too. So, and they work together, so it's a it's a pretty key piece. I'll make the motion. We approve. Second. May I say one more comment? Yes. Of course. Forgive me, but I thought that's what department heads were for, and it's just a situation where people come in to county government or government bodies, businesses, and so forth, and say, let me show you what I can do for you. And we bite and we pay. That's, and I could be wrong, but I swear I don't remember this one. And I appreciate uh, Tori uh, letting me know the uh, minutes of that particular meeting uh, where we initially approved it. Thank you. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Carter. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank the motion you. carries. I think because um, we have two commissioners remotely, um, in the past they both voted the same, but this time it's different. So. For purposes of the minutes and the record keeping, uh, I'll note that Commissioner Boswell voted yes and Commissioner Sutton voted no. So that our minutes will be
correct. Is that what I'm supposed to do, Mr. Albright? It is. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, next item on our agenda is uh, the library department is here to apply for a COVID-19 response mini grant. He's gone to go get her, just so y'all know. Here she comes. Good evening, Commissioners. Hi, how are you? Good Doing evening. good, how are you? Good. Wonderful. So I've come before you this evening to request um, approval to apply for a grant and the budget amendment that would come with it if we are awarded the grant. So the grant is being put out by the Library Services and Technology Act program, which is administered through the North Carolina State Library. Um, it, we would be eligible for up to $2,500. We could get any amount less than that as well. The grant is called the, um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, it is a, a COVID-19 response mini grant. So it is for funds to purchase whatever we need to get libraries reopened for the public again. Um, if you can imagine the points of contact between a, a public person from the public, our patrons and our staff and the patrons at each other are pretty high in a library. You touch a lot of things, you interact very closely, computers are right next to each other on computers, um, on tables, lots of chairs and seating. So in order to get things so that they are, they can still practice safe social distancing, they have hand sanitizers and clean bathrooms and things like that. Um, this is just a little bit of financial help to be able to get things in place. I think it's a good idea. I'll make the motion we approve. Is there any county match required in that? Nope. I didn't think there was, right. Okay. I'll second it. All right. Mr. Lashley has made a motion to approve the application for that mini grant, and Mr. Carter has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion? No. If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the next item is a budget amendment for a capital project fund. Good evening again, Commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, before you is a budget amendment that we would look at decreasing our capital project fund by 2.8 million if you will recall on september 16th 2019 we brought before you a um, budget ordinance that created the capital project in the amount of five million dollars we have since put some of those projects on hold what this will do is it will align our budget with the 2.2 million that you will be voting on at the next meeting but this will go ahead and align our budget to our current costs and our current project Question. Go ahead. <laughs> um, are we putting everything out to bid on the um, projects? <clears throat> yes, indeed. And what's the square footage of the roof on the courthouse? Well, I have to have Buddy Weitzel here this evening, so let me grab Buddy and get him to step in here, and we can speak to the details much more effectively than I can. I'll be right back. All right, so um, for purposes of the minutes, uh, we're going to get Buddy Weitzel, and since he's coming in, the sheriff has stepped out, so we're at 10 people. Right. Still less than 10, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, square footage roof, I'm not quite sure. I didn't know that was going to be in, but I think it's somewhere around 5,600 square feet, but I had to look it up and get it to him. Did you hear that, Mr. Sutton? Okay, you broke up. You broke up. I didn't hear it. What, what did you say? Uh, I'm not quite sure the square footage off the top of my head. I had to go back and look at it. But I think it's, I'm not sure. It might be 5,600 or 10,000 square feet. 
I had to look it up and get it to me. That's a big difference. I'd like to know that if you don't mind. Will we see the bids that come in on these projects? Yes. It's been bidded out. Well, I think we received uh, four bids on that roof. Is that a replacement or It's a repair? new roof. It's a replacement. Replacement. That's the cheapest way to go. Yes. The roof was put on in 96, the current roof. Thank you. Anything else? Um, no. I don't think so. Any, but Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions for Buddy Weitzel? No, that's good. I'm all right. Okay. Thank all right. You. I'll see if I can find that. Thank you. All right. In relation to this, I, I've had a, a lot of comments from members of our community concerning borrowing this money. And this is the other side of the issue of the budget amendment, but I have uh, been trying to think of a way to figure out where we might be once we put money back into our general fund, our fund balance. Um, is there any way that we can come up with an estimate of where we will be at the end of the year on a percentage? basis so, so we'll know where we are on our target where we are from the state perspective and and then where we i know we have no idea where we're going to be going forward because we don't know what we're going to have to spend but so the you know it's hard that's a hard call to make right now because we're in a uh yeah place once where you we've start you gotta you gotta finish yes and uh but our best estimate and understand that this is an estimate uh is that at the end of uh, 2020, we could see the, um, and this is because we're doing all kinds of changes. I think at the next meeting, we're bringing several uh, changes where we put several million dollars back into fund balance from the school system. We could be looking at uh, the county's fund balance going from the current unassigned fund balance, unassigned. This is the money that's available for us to do whatever we want to with from about $18 million to possibly $26 million. That would take us from 12 and a half percent to maybe 15 to 16% if we borrow these funds. If we don't borrow the $2.2 million, then we would probably be closer to $23 million and maybe 14%. So what I would tell the commissioners is, you know, we're getting ready to go into a rather uncertain time. We're already in an uncertain time financially. Uh, there is value my opinion to having the cash in the unassigned fund balance we have plenty of debt capacity uh, we have already built in the the loan cost into our capital plan so it's not something that has to be specifically new and included in the 2021 budget Th those are discussions obviously for for uh, the next the next meeting but i know there's concern from the commissioners about should we borrow the money or should we just most of these projects are complete Right? So this is us reimbursing ourselves. We used re a reimbursement resolution to go ahead and start the project. And that's what we said we were gonna do. That's right. So the question for the board to think about, I think between now and um, the next meeting uh, is, do you want to go into 2021 with cash, more cash in your pocket, but yes, having the debt or not? That, that's, that's really the question. So. And we could prepay that debt if it looked like it was gonna be a burden on our budget going forward, correct? Yes, there may be some penalty to do that, but obviously it would be, uh, you know, if you wind up taking on the debt and we go through next fiscal year and halfway through the fiscal year, the revenues turn around and we're seeing, you know, significant uptick from what I think we might see, uh, then the board could make the decision to pay the debt early if, if you wanted to. But, uh, there's some value in, and I'm sorry to get into this, I don't want to detract from what this is really all about is setting the budget correctly, but um, just food for thought. And what I think I could do uh, is send the board an email with these points for you to think. Okay. So, so we're not going to vote tonight? Well, we do We do need a, uh, to fix the budget uh, regardless of whether or not you do the loan. You will need to vote on the loan until next meeting. Well, I'm not going to support that loan. I think we, I think it's uh, in this particular cycle, so I think we need to pay for it. If we already started, should pay for it and not borrow that money. We got enough borrowed uh, just to pay for the schools. 
and ACC. So let's understand the um, item on the agenda, the budget amendment. Refresh our minds about why why would we have a budget amendment before we vote on whether or not we want to do the contract. So what this budget amendment is doing is it's aligning it to the 2.2 million, which is the project cost. Um, like Brian said, a lot of this cost we have already expended. Um, so what this will do is it'll align the budget to the projects that Buddy has already started. Um, and then from there, if at the next meeting the board elects not to go through with the financing, then we would bring an additional budget amendment to the board where we would transfer those costs um, over to the general fund. So, so the original project budget was $5 million. Correct. So this is taking it down to 2.2, which is where Two. we have stopped. Then at the next meeting, the commissioners would be deciding to pay that 2.2 with debt or with uh, unsigned fund by. Okay. So the budget amendment doesn't have anything to do with approving or not approving the contract. That is correct. Okay. Motion to approve. Okay. Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve the budget amendment. Second. Mr. Boswell has seconded that motion. Is there any more discussion? All in favor of the budget amendment, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, uh. All opposed? No. Okay, so the motion carries uh, four to one. Mr. Lashley votes no. And Mr. Uh, Boswell and Mr. Sutton both voted aye. Excuse me. All right, the next item on our agenda is public speakers who wish to be heard by the board on items which are not related to agenda items so we had somebody that wanted us to call them hopefully they hadn't gone to bed yes madam chair we had um, actually received two more additional um, non-agenda item comments so if i could read those then we will call um miss donna van hook of burlington so she can be ready and i'll go ahead and read the um, two non-agenda item comments the first one is from Lee Welburn, 2134 Wren Street. A general comment, with people being released from Alamance County Jail early, I see some of them need drug help. How is Alamance County tracking this? I just saw Friday several arrested again on drug charges. How will we address this? The second comment is from Dana Courtney, 2521 Rogers Road, Graham. Commissioner uh, Chair Gailey, Commissioners Lashley, Sutton, Boswell, and Carter, thank you for this opportunity to submit comments for your consideration for the May 18, 2020 meeting. I support the continued program for the mobile cafe provided by Alamance County via the public library system. While we have some sections and economic group, groups able to readily secure internet services and materials, it is not the case for all individuals and groups. Services provided by the Mobile Cafe have been a success during the recent months of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I hope our county will be in a position to continue funding for our current outreach groups as well as explore other areas which may be in need as the 2021 budget is approved and financed. I believe the Mobile Cafe program will be able to benefit all groups, especially students and others seeking educational support. Thank you for your services the county has provided during this year, especially these past months, as you have faced events not experienced in the past. Dana and Courtney. And now I will try to call Miss Donna Van Hook. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Three. Three, six, She's six, calling seven, seven five, three, two, four, four is not available. 
The mailbox is full and cannot accept any message. She's tried to call back. Just hit the ring phone. It'll just ring. Yeah, well, she was trying to call while I was calling her. I'm sorry, that extension. Okay. I don't. Mm -mm. I don't get that one. Where's the number? Right here. Six. Thank you. Hello? Miss Van Hook? Okay, you're connected to the county commissioners meeting. Hi, Ms. Van Hook. I'm Amy Gailey. I'm chair of the Almas County Board of Commissioners. How are you? All right. Good. I understand. Uh, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Well, thank you for it to everyone. Thank you for reaching out and um, you know making it possible that we could talk to you. Uh, you have three minutes for your public comment, and you can begin at any time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this public comment will uh, be in relationship to the one you just heard read uh, and it's meant to advocate for the mobile cafe room in East Burlington neighborhoods that have a distinct need for internet access. Uh, our next visiting the coalition led the organizing of uh, key persons to coordinate Wi-Fi internet route that was uh, carried out by the mobile cafe of Alamance County Public Library. Uh, they provided services uh, beginning in April on the 13th until the end of ABSS school year. And this was for six Burlington Housing Authority apartment complexes, uh, Beaumont Avenue and Tucker Street Apartment, which uh, share management, uh, Mrs. Springs Mobile Home Park. These neighborhoods are primarily on the east side of Burlington. The mobile cafe serves as address the inequity of the digital divide for disadvantaged families. It also um, was advantageous for the lack of resources for families due to physical distancing and uh, social isolation by the Executive Order 121 and economic hardship caused by COVID-19 pandemic. So I would just like to reiterate what you just heard, uh, that it would be great for us to have uh, a route in East Burlington that is equal to the one that's in the rural parts of the county. That is my public comment. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Van Hook. Um, do we have any uh, commissioner responses to our public speakers? Madam Chair, we do have our library director still here to answer any questions you have. Okay. Um, do any of the commissioners have a comment? A question? No. Um, Sheriff, no. we had a concern from somebody who was worried about people being released from the jail early and needing help for drugs. Um, do, you, do you have any input on that? Are people being released from the Alamance County Jail early? Uh, they're being released. Uh, a lot of them are being arrested. Let them sign their own bond. We'll catch them two weeks later, a week later. You know, uh, we're just having to do what, what we have to do. Uh, and they are being released, a lot of them, early. When I say early, I'm talking about not having to post bond. Right. Let them go or a $200 bond and we're winding up catching them again. Do you know if um, they're getting any help for drug addiction problems? I, I do not. I know, uh, you know, uh, some when they go into jail may uh, start withdrawing and we may have to take them to mental health. Those uh, will be seen. But uh, at this point, once they're released, 
we have no control over. In terms of both the judges. Do what, sir? The judge. That term. Or magistrates. Term, judges and magistrates. And I don't touch that bond. <laughs> not, You're I, not a participant. I'm not sitting a bond. <laughs> well, we have litigation ongoing, so. Good. Less said, better. I Thank have you. a question so about that process, it. too. Um, sorry, Tim, were you still talking? Or Bill? I'll go ahead. If somebody's released on a on a low bond and then rearrested, do they then have to forfeit the bond? No, sir. So if they get re released, they have to post another two hundred dollar bond or is that original? Okay. I don't have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Um, as far as helping people with drug problems, you do have Steve Ginter working in the jail, right? He works in the jail. And that's if a pre in release. the jail, uh, you know, he, they do evaluation, and help evaluation, et cetera. And if, if there's something that can be done, certainly he tries to, uh, you know, see that that's done. But the problem we're running to, and uh, I think probably what she's talking about is being arrested, released. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if there's no other commissioner responses, do you have a report from the county manager's office? Uh, the commissioners, remember, uh, I'm planning to bring a recommended budget for fiscal year 2021 to the June 1st commissioner's meeting. You presented there, and the commissioners had discussed at the last meeting uh, interest in holding a work session on June the 8th. Uh, I was wanting to poll the board, see if that's still an interest, and if so, uh, maybe what time that might be uh, considered, and then if, if it is, then we'll uh, be sure we put an item on the agenda for uh, the meeting on June the 1st. So uh, if that's still an interest, it might be uh, reasonable to think yeah, about. It is for me. Would be for me too, yes. Yes, I think that there's a consensus that we look forward to June 8th. And um, I've floated the time of 10 a.m. to some of the commissioners, so I'm not sure if I got all yeah, of it. Yeah, good with me. Oh, that could work for me that, too. That would work for me, Mrs. Eddie. And um, we were talking about where to have it so that we could be socially distanced. Uh, I don't know if June the 8th that's still going to be a concern, but I think if it's... If we all going to be 10, I don't see it's a problem here. Because nobody needs to be in there but the county attorney and the county manager. Yeah, we're just kind of close. And maybe finance. We're just kind of close on each other here. Okay. Maybe you don't want me to read it on you. Yeah. <laughs> so we could use maybe um, the annex across the street, or maybe we could go to Impact Alamance if it's available. Um, yes. So, do you have any thoughts about that? Either one of those works for me. Yeah. I miss the locations. I heard the annex. What was the second one you mentioned? Impact Alamance, maybe, if, the, if we can get a reservation. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing the name. Impact Alamance. What is the problem with our chamber? It's just uh, kind of close. If we're supposed to be socially distancing, then we'll be elbow to elbow with each other. And also, personally, I think it's better to have a budget discussion where we can see one another better instead of sitting in a line. <coughs> Well, I'll sit on the back row. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all want to have it in here and spread out around the room, that's fine with me. I just I thought I'd, I'd like I'll to see that. The annex is fine or over there, you know. <laughs> what do you think, Mr. Carter? Is it? I'm good with whatever everybody wants to do. Mr. Sutton, did you have another question? Comment? No, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, is is the uh, message going to be a morning meeting or evening evening meet, meeting? The recommended budget. Uh, it'll be a morning. Okay, thank you. Now, is he talking about the? He's talking about the June. Talking about the June, June yeah. I think he was talking about the June eighth or eighth meeting, right? Oh, uh, the June eighth meeting. I think ten a.m. Ten o'clock, right? No, I'm talking about the budget message. From okay. you, your recommended budget. Sorry. That'll be June 1, and that'll be the 9 a.m. meeting. That's the morning meeting. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, if it's okay with everybody, we'll do the June 8th meeting at 10 at the Annex, if that's okay. 
What do you call an annex? It's the cross. Yeah, the corner, across okay. the street. So then we can sit around a big table and okay. see each other, and maybe have some snacks. That's a good idea. Very well. That's all that I have. This used to be considered an annex. That's why I was asking. That's true. We need to maybe name that building. <laughs> All right, so uh, commissioner comments. Does anybody have any commissioner comments tonight? I have one thing. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I don't. I didn't. Don't have any. I'm just looking forward. Actually, uh, coming back to a real meeting. I know. I know. Me too, Eddie. It'll be nice. It will be to have a normal meeting with people and everything. Um, I did have a commissioner comment to update the board on the land development plan steering committee. That work has continued to go on through Zoom and um, there is a presentation that the consultant that the county hired on the land development plan that is available to be seen on the planning department's website. Also, there is a survey, so it's not a scientific poll because it's self-selected people deciding themselves that they wanted to fill it out. But it was a survey that they did that was through uh, social media and the results of that are able to be seen on the um, planning department's website on the land development plan steering committee's webpage. So I think there will be more community events planned for uh, the future coming up when um, we have fewer restrictions and I just really appreciate the planning department's hard work on that and I'm so happy that the effort continues to unfold and I really encourage all the commissioners to look at the results of the survey because they're really interesting. So now we have a closed session so I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute section 143-318.11A3 to consult with the county attorney and preserve the client attorney client privilege. <coughs> Can I have a second? Yeah. Yeah. I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Boss. Well, we have a motion and a second to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Um. Anyone opposed? Okay, so we're gonna, the commissioners are gonna stay in here because we got people on the phone and we're gonna turn off the recorder. Mm -hmm. exactly. and, and the streamer. Live and the streamer. streamer. I think we need a motion to return to open session. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to return to open session. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So uh, the statement after the closed session is that the board has consulted with this attorney on a confidential personnel matter. So all the business before the board being concluded, we will be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. 
If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.